Hallelujah. What a Savior. Full atonement. How can that be? We who have sinned much, the Lord Jesus has paid it all. He has paid for every bit of our sin so that we could enter in. Well, isn't it, as already mentioned, ironic? Here on this Friday that we call Good Friday, a day in which we have already sung and reflected on and heard read about a bloody cross. Jesus was nailed to a tree. Nails were driven through not just the bones of his hands, they were driven through the arteries of his wrists. And then one through both legs being crossed over through the feet and through the arteries there. To inflict the most pain possible in one of the cruelest forms of death in all of human history. The cross. It was meant to inflict pain and long suffering. One would hang there and all they would be able to do would press up on those nails to try and grasp for breath and air. Even in the day that Jesus was crucified, it was a shock to Pilate that he was already dead. Because on the cross it was expected for those who suffer long hours, days even, slowly suffocating to death. No more strength to pull himself up. And here is what Jesus did on that Friday, on that very good Friday. Why was it good when he literally became a curse for us? We see from Deuteronomy 21, 23, his body shall not remain all night on the tree that you shall bury him the same day, for a hangman is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. To be hanged on a tree was a curse by God, and yet this is the way that the Lord Jesus died on a tree. We've seen in the scripture readings, thank you to Kieran and Siebert for reading our passage already this evening. We've seen that these were some of the darkest days, or the darkest day, for literally three hours, the earth was filled with darkness. That's what we've seen here in Mark 15 so far. But I want us now to come back to reflect on three of these verses. Mark 15, verses 37 through 39. So you can hear them fresh when you read them. And if you have your Bible, I invite you to, to go ahead and open up to Mark. If you don't, grab that Red Pew Bible. It's on page 1014 there. 1014. Hear the word of the Lord from Mark 15, verses 37 through 39 once more. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now, if you are normally with us, you know I like to give a main idea for those visiting with us. I, I give this main idea to try and sum up uh, these this passage and, and the point of this, in this case, devotion. And here it is. In his death, Jesus rips open the curtain of separation between God and man so that we can now enter the holy place and live. We repeat that. In his death, Jesus rips open the curtain of separation between God and man so that we can now enter the holy place. And live. We're going to look at this in three brief points. Point number one, the final breath. Point number two, the torn curtain. And point number three, the surprising confession. Point number one, the final breath. It was 9 a.m. local time in Jerusalem. 
when they nailed Jesus to the tree. He was nailed there on that Good Friday. He was mocked. He was reviled. And then three hours later, darkness fell upon the earth. We see there in the sixth hour at noon, this darkness came over. And it lasted for three hours. From the sixth hour till the ninth. Till 3 p.m. But this was no accidental darkness. This was not something that could be explained away by an eclipse of, of any kind. The seasons and the timetables wouldn't allow it. Not to mention God had already foretold what would come. In Amos 8 9 we read this. And on that day declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. The darkness was God's way of signaling that darkness has covered the earth and his judgment was coming and being carried out. It was coming to be carried out on who? The very one who cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The very one hung to the tree, the very one who was without sin, was pierced for our transgressions. Jesus is the one that hangs on the cross. He identifies with David as he cries out from Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David and Jesus both utterly felt forsaken for God's purpose and plan in the midst of it, and yet they still both cried, My God, my God recognizing who he was. And if you know Psalm 22 and the biblical theology, you know that Jesus is emphasizing here just as David. He knew God had not utterly forsaken him, even though he felt that in a moment. He never stopped hoping. Jesus, in his suffering, never stopped hoping in this plan and trusting the Father. And yet, he did feel forsaken because he was drinking up the full cup of God's righteous wrath that we deserved. That righteous wrath deserved to come against us. We deserve to be judged and condemned. And yet Jesus comes to drink it all. Friends, it is in this way that Jesus on that Good Friday bore his cross and died, for he breathed his last there in verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. He breathed his last for us. But for what purpose? Simply to take away sin? What end goal? Point number two, the torn curtain. Verse 38. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What is this torn curtain? Well, if you were paying attention, adults during the children's story, the, the children got a, a watered, or not watered down, a, a simple explanation of what that curtain is. But let me give us the, the full uh, explanation right here. Exodus 26, 31 through 33 reads this. And you shall make a bell of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. The big angels, the warrior angels, keep out right there. And you shall hang it on the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver, and you shall hang the bell from the clasp and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the bell. And the bell shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. You see these curtains that Moses was instructed to make for the tabernacle and then would later be made for the temple and the building of it. These were the big keep out signs saying, God dwells here in the most holy place, but you can't come in because of your sin. Your sin keeps you out from the most wonderful place, from 
being with a most holy God. That's what these curtains represent. It was reminders that he, the curtains were there to remind us it is good to live with God, but we can't enter that goodness. Why? Well, because of what took place in the garden. If you're familiar with the Bible, forgive me as you hear this again, but this is mostly for you who may not be as familiar. God created the heavens and the earth. He created it all in the beginning, in the very good beginning, and it was all good. There was no sadness, no sorrow. There were no tears. There was no wrong. Families that relational strife you probably had this week, guess what? None of that existed in the garden because it was all perfect. It was only once sin entered the world these things began, and that sin began when Adam and Eve rejected God as their king, as their rightful ruler. They rejected his rule, the, the one tree they were forbidden to eat from. Never mind, they had all the other trees, all the other fruit they could eat. One tree that symbolized this very fact. I am your creator, and you are to be under my rule. And they were forbidden to eat of this tree of good, of knowledge of good and evil. And yet they ate of it. And from that moment, sin entered into the garden. They were forced out, and now every man born, because they are born in Adam, is born in sin. In fact, David in Psalm 51 says, In my mother's womb I was conceived in sin. Everything about us is sinful. Therefore, we're all in this necessity of being kept out of God's most holy place, out of the holy of holies. So none would enter this most holy place except for the high priest and he but once a year after being purified. And yet, this God wanted to restore us in our, the midst of us being sinners and rebels, committing treason against him, he wanted to make a way. How? How could he tear this curtain? You see, for all of human history, and even some of us here this evening, we may think that that curtain can be torn up if we work our way up. If we do enough good deeds, we can tear the curtain from the bottom up if we do enough acts of righteousness, we can tear that curtain from the bottom up. If we're religious enough and attend enough religious services, even those most holy days, we can tear the curtain from the bottom up. But that's not how the curtain comes tumbling down. Friends, you and I will never be able to rip the curtain on our own. Jesus, in his death, tears the curtain from the top down. Verse 38 once more. And the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You see in Jesus' shedding of his blood and his sacrificial death on the cross that keep out sign was no longer needed. It was no longer needed to separate a holy God from sinful man. Because Jesus shed his blood to wash away our sins and make us white as snow. All may enter if they are covered by the blood of the Lamb. If they rest in his sacrifice on the cross. And God tears that curtain into from top to bottom as only he can do. So friends, let us see. The only way to enter in is never of something of our own efforts. It is only what Jesus has done on the cross. Why can we say when we are brought before God in judgment that we deserve to enter in? I'm paraphrasing something Alistair Begg used a, a year or so ago about the man on the middle cross. But why can we enter in? Why is the curtain torn? It's not because you and I work our way up. It's not because we had enough faith and belief. It's not because we came to the right understanding and understand substitutionary atonement. It's because of Jesus' blood being shed, shed that tore that or that curtain in two from top to bottom. It's because of what he did. We are allowed to enter in this most holy place before this most holy God. What Jesus has done 
is he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary so that you and I, friend, could live. And it is in his shed blood that we can enter with confidence. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 goes on to add, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest, or a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, with our bodies washed with pure water. And this is the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. Christ took the blame for us. Christ bore the wrath for us. And because Christ did these on the cross, we can stand forgiven at the cross. It is our names written in his wounds. It is through his suffering we are made. Let us behold the wonder of the cross of Calvary on that Good Friday. This is why it is good. But what is it depending on? Point number three, the surprising confession. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. The centurion was a Roman soldier. He was over those under him. This was not his first crucifixion that he had seen. Rome was known for these. Traitors, thieves would have been hung on crosses. The centurion would have probably seen hundreds, if not thousands, of crucifixions. So it's not the cross in itself that causes him to, to stand in awe and say, this was the Son of God. It was the way in which Jesus hung on the cross and what was said about him. Friends, this centurion's all that Jesus, in the midst of being mocked and ridiculed by those standing there that day, remained silent. He remained silent before his shears. As they said, you saved others, but could save yourselves, or save yourself. He sat there and endured. One of the Gospels actually says, cries out, Father, forgive them. He cries out this in the midst of being crucified by the crowds. Jesus endured on the cross. And even as he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He breathes his last in laying and giving up his spirit. He lays it down and therefore in all of this and possibly things he had already heard, the centurion comes to the conclusion, truly this was the Son of God. This was the this Jesus was who he said he was. He is the one who's come to take away the sins of the world. And he confessed. Friends, the blood of Jesus has washed away our sins. <clears throat> Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross has made a way for the curtain to be torn wide open and for us to enter in. The only thing we need is to acknowledge this truth to confess it, to believe Jesus is the Son of God, who came to lay down his life, to rescue such sinners like us. Will we leave here this evening reflecting on this? If we've not believed this, then coming to the place of belief for the first time, and for the believer, may we marvel in the cross and never forget that the cross is the only way we have salvation. And therefore, rejoice all the more in what Jesus has done for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray. Lord, recognizing that Jesus died and was buried in order to take away our sins. But Lord, we also know Sunday's coming. We know that we have hope because of Jesus and the remarkable events that took place in these three days, with his death and his resurrection. Father, Lord, even now as we come to remember and reflect on this in the Lord's Supper, would we pray, Lord, that we would just respond with thankfulness for the cross. Thank you, Lord, for the cross and what has been won. 
We ask and pray this in Jesus' name.